Chris. <laughs> oh, I'm so, so thrilled to see you because I just miss you in general. So to even see you on a laptop is fabulous. Yeah, same. Like, it's been too long. And it's even been though, like, way too been long. Really great. Like, I think uh, it's not, <laughs> you just can't really replace seeing each other face to face, can you really? It's not the same. It's not. It's going to be handy going forward with certain things, but to be in a room with someone that you really love hanging out with, there's nothing like it. So this is as good as it's going to get for now. Um, officially, welcome to the Virtual Happy Place Festival. I am just delighted that you wanted to be part of it. You were there at the live event last year, um, and obviously we, we haven't been able to do that this year. So, so this is the setup. We're going to have a nice little chat here that I think people will love. So uh, for people that are um, new to knowing about our friendship, um, we've known each other a very, very long time now. Mm, yeah, it has been a while. Like eight? No, hang on. Nine, nine years. Nine years. Nine. It is nine because I remember I met you a little bit before I met my husband. And I actually met my husband, weirdly, nine years ago today. So I know you, I've known you longer. I've known you longer. Um, and so nine years ago, you were in Ibiza. Yes, I was in Ibiza. I know, raving it up. And now we're in the peeing rain. And anyway, um, so I, I met you. Um, I found out all about Copperfield, the incredible charity that you founded and wanted in on it big time. And we've done some lovely things over the years that you've just with your determination and passion driven to make happen, which has been absolutely wonderful. And we're going to talk about Copperfield in a little bit, but there's some other stuff I want to talk about first. And let's start with this weird situation we're in. Lockdown has been utterly bizarre for everybody. And I don't know about you, but I am, I'm quite sick of it now. I just, I'm over not being able to see people like we've just said. Um, and we've talked about this privately. I know that, you know, lockdown for you, you've had to be, you know, strict and disciplined about it for health reasons. So you, you have been, you know, pretty much on your road. How, how have you been dealing with that? Do you know what? I think um, for people with cancer, this hasn't been as much, as much of a, like, change in lifestyle as I think a lot of people think. Um, like we're already, well, I speak on, to, on behalf of like everyone else again, but I feel like I'm already used to adapting the way I have to live for the sake of my health. Um, and so when obviously lockdown happened, it was obviously a bit crap, but at the same time, it was kind of a relief that everyone else was in the same boat. For, for mm. once, I wasn't the one that had to miss out because of cancer. I had to miss out. So does it, so did everyone else. Um, so, but yeah, I am. I mean, I'm in the higher risk category because I have um, cancer still, and I have to take a chemotherapy pill, which compromises my immune system a little bit. Um, I mean, to be honest, they want, they're not really sure how much higher my risk is, but you just can't really take that risk. And as my oncologist, I mean, painfully and shockingly had to admit to me, um, if I was to get really sick with this virus um, and they looked at all of the people who need, and the hospital was full and all the ventilators were, you know, taken, I would be at the bottom of the list. And like, that's obviously, you know, that's hard to hear and hard to like even comprehend when you obviously look at me and I look fine and, and I, I, you know, I deserve to have it as much as everyone else, but because oh, um, cancer, God, patients, Chris. Don't cancer patients would be at the bottom of the list to get ventilators. I can't really um, comprehend that. And uh, God, I mean, and as a, someone that absolutely loves you, I, you know, that's just the pits. And I, I didn't know that. That's just, I mean, these are the things that... Um, I think it's really important for people to to know that you know when you're living with cancer and going through this world pandemic that we're all experiencing there are way more risks and there are a lot of things that you need to consider and 
I wonder um, what the other hurdles have been for cancer patients at the moment, because you know, if people have to have regular treatment, and especially at the beginning of lockdown, when we know that hospitals were absolutely full to the brim of people and wards that are usually for other illnesses or, or care were taken over as COVID wards, how, how has that affected cancer patients over the last three months? Um, I mean, I hate to throw stats at people, but I think numbers sometimes really help to pay, make people understand like the the enormity of the issue. But 2.5 million people have either missed treatment, screening or um, tests. Um, so that means that, you know, like, you know, um, cervical screening hasn't happened as it should do. Breast cancer screening hasn't happened as it should. Bowel cancer screening hasn't happened. Um, and people have avoided going to the doctor. Um, so 60% in April, 60% less people went to the doctor about any cancer symptoms. Wow. Like that's huge. And so they're estimating that this year there's going to be an 18,000 plus extra deaths of cancer. Oh my God. So, you know, I think there's this, you know, cancer used to be the big C, but now COVID has taken over and it's a real bastard for doing that because it has shelved cancer to the bottom of the list for everyone's priority it's like it's heartbreaking that people have had to um stop treatment or that yeah like some of the wards have been taken over but for covid patients and cancer patients have had to kind of sidestep away and um a lot of cancer research labs have been yeah. taken the covid tests rather than yeah. researching treatments for cancer patients it's like, it's, it's massive. And I think, yes, we're coming out of the other side, hopefully. I mean, like, I'd like to think it's positive that what's happening right now, but after all this, like, you know, charities like Cobfield, like old cancer charities and um, oncologists are going to be picking up the pieces because well, it's absolutely. a massive this is why Copperfield is, you know, like you say, all charities that are dealing with either cancer research or awareness or prevention are going to need a huge boost of awareness and of funds. It's absolutely imperative. And, and talking about the message that Copperfield has always put out there for people to understand is, you know, because we aren't having, you know, I know you, that we're dealing with breast cancer here and that's what Copperfield has always focused on, but because people aren't having mammograms or cervical smear tests, um, with, without having mammograms, at least what you're saying is at home, we can check our boobs. We can have a feel around. We, can, we don't have to wait to go to the doctors to do that. We can feel, we can get our partners to feel, our friends to feel, and just feel if there is anything abnormal. And obviously the Copperfield website has you know, all the, the tips and advice and, and the guidelines around that. And then as you say now, hopefully things are starting to quieten down. People then can react on that and, and get to the doctors. Well, people can and always have been able to through this whole thing. And I think people yeah, have been too scared to um, mm. uh, and um, just didn't think it was a priority anymore. Um, and, but the, you know, because of Copperfield, so many people have still acted on their symptoms and we've heard so many stories during this time of people that said, if I hadn't seen your message, I wouldn't have gone and I wouldn't have Gosh. just had my diagnosis. Um, so it's, it's really frightening, but do you know what I also think, cause I don't want to just dwell on the doom and gloom yeah, but yeah, I, yeah. because we've all had to focus on our health a little bit more. I'd like to think that that would have a good positive knock on effect on how we see our health in general. And that when we're so like, we've become so obsessed with noticing any signs and symptoms of COVID-19, let's now switch that to anything that might be different in your body. Let's mm -hmm. now think, well, I've been so obsessed with it for the last three months. Maybe this is something that I need to take on for life. And it doesn't have to be a scary thing. Um, well, yeah, exactly. It needs to be, it's something to save, to save you. If you get, you know, if you, if you notice symptoms or abnormalities early on, you know, that's what the whole Copperfield message is. And I think, I hadn't thought of it in this way, Chris, if I'm honest with you. And I think that's such an important thing you've just said that, you know, we have become sort of hyper aware of now looking for these symptoms. Do I have a, a cough or whatever it might be? And, and now we need to apply that to everything to, you know, keep a, a good state of wellness. Um, another thing that everybody has talked about a lot during this period is, you know, how many times have we heard the word uncertainty? And we're still in that frame of mind because we don't know 
when all restrictions are lifted and when things will go back to any kind of normal. But again, this is something that you live with daily. And, um, and it's, you know, knowing you as a friend, that, that awareness of uncertainty, I've always observed has been something that has made you hugely, hugely focused, like more than anyone I know and massively motivated to put it bluntly you get shit done and it's always been a wonderful wonderful thing to see but of course we should always be living in the moment doing things that we want to do that are pipe dreams or whatever we need to just do them um and i wonder how you you feel about the sort of shift in consciousness there because i think people do feel desperate once this is over to kind of do the stuff they're desperately wanting to do yeah but i i don't know about you but i think i have seen a shift in people's priorities and um, figuring out, I hate the term, but a new normal that is yeah. just as good um, as life before. I mean, obviously we are missing things and there's certain things we want to get back to that are from our life before, but there are things that we probably want to leave behind. Yeah. Um, and I think that's certainly an experience that I got from cancer is like refocusing on what is, in, what is important um, and I think the more we deal with uncertainty, the more resilient we get um, yes. and the more we can face things um, because we have to be adaptable. And I think that's been such a, an interesting observation for me as well, for someone who's had to adapt so much in life already is like seeing everyone else adapt. And I think, doesn't that just confirm that we as creatures, we are adaptable and we can, we can sway and move in the wind if we have to. And I think that is, that is a good thing to kind of learn from this and kind of go do you know what if something shit happens again i can deal with it um mm. if that's another virus or cancer or whatever mm, i i completely agree i think you know i've seen people in my own sort of circles and also when you you know look outside the window globally as to how people are reacting you do see that you know, that people are a lot stronger than they believe they are and can cope with a lot more stress than they thought. Um, you know, like even in a sort of silly, stupid level, if you told me, oh, your kids aren't going to be going to school for three months and you've got to deal with that, I would go, absolutely no way can I handle that. But we sort of are, you know, we're doing it. And I think, you know, there is, there is more strength in all of us and we just haven't necessarily had to use it but it but we have an arsenal of it in there it's in there ready to go when we need it um and, and another, another thing really handy, go on. sorry it's just really handy for people like with cancer because you know so often i get asked how do you cope and i can now turn the question on you like well how have you coped with having to deal with this massive global pandemic and it, mm. and you would answer i didn't have a choice yeah <laughs> yeah and this is it. Often when there's a worst case scenario, we think I, that I absolutely could not, there's no way that, that, I could, that I could have that in my life, deal with that in my life, or a global pandemic seemed like a sort of fantasy film script before this year. And we would never have thought we would be able to deal with that. But, but you do, because you have to, and you find that inner strength. And it's something that I've massively witnessed from being your friend that you are somebody that has huge levels of happiness in your life and um and you're grateful and you know you you're living a you know a life with happiness and joy but i know that that's also meant that you've you've made decisions that have to work for you and you've done brilliant things like you've moved to the seaside like simple fundamental things we know that help with our mental and physical health you are by that big roaring sea and you take great joy in small things like really nice cups of tea and stuff like that but it's all this it's all the stuff that we should be doing anyway but we put it off like oh no no i i can be stressed for now i've got a lot on i'll do all that nice you know good stuff for my health later down the line um and i think again lockdowns made us all think about that perhaps in you know, maybe not as uh, with the severity that, that you've had to, but I think people are now going, well, what do I enjoy? And what makes, and what's gonna help with my health? Yeah. Yeah, and I, do you know what? At the beginning of lockdown, you know how I mean, so many people were 
you know, philosophizing um, over all of this and like coming up with these great plans and goals of things that they might achieve. I mean, parents probably not so much. So they were just trying to no. survive. But a lot of people were saying, you know, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to start this project that I've been putting off. And I was just sitting, like quietly sitting going, mm-hmm. good luck with that. Yeah, mm. good luck with that. And then, and now for them to go, do you know what? I started and failed and that is okay. And actually I, I've just learned to survive and I've found joy in being able to get through the day is enough. And it's like, yes, that is enough. Mm. It's and not all about these big yeah. goals and projects. Yeah. It's just yeah. about, you know, some of the happiest times that we've had during lockdown have been like, honey's just learned to ride a bike. And we went on our first family bike ride. And it was like, oh my God, this is such a step that we're all on bikes. I mean, saying that, I can hear her going absolutely crazy downstairs at Jessie screaming. But it was nice a few days ago. And we, we just had one of those moments where there was nothing achieved, you know, on our part, no grand scheme. It was just, wow, look, we're at this stage where we're all riding a bike together. And I probably would have taken that slightly more for granted, you know, prior to this time of being trapped in four walls the whole time. You know, you've, you've worked insanely hard to essentially survive the last 11 years. And um, I've seen a little bit of that as an outsider, the time and dedication, and also uh, courage to have, you know, total agency over your own life and and making big decisions. Um, So you've put all that hard work in and now we find ourselves shut out from the, the big experiences of life that we might like. And as I've said, you know, you are someone that grabs life and you go for it and you've traveled and you've 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 completed amazing projects and dreams that you've put out there and I wonder how you're feeling now that's been taken away that you know you can't plan the next big Copperfield event you can't go and you know jump in a freezing lake in Sweden you know you you're at home how how has that been mentally um I think hard um I think yeah you know, when you, when you, when you get like, for example, when I get good scan results, I feel like my world is big again. And, um, and just before I get scan results, my world feels really small and it's shrunk into this tiny little hole that I feel like I get lost in. And, um, and I think having the virus that feels like so out of my control, because at least with cancer, I felt like I got back some control of it. And then this virus happened where I felt like, okay, my world has been shrunk again. And now I have, I have, I don't feel like I had the tools in my box to kind of deal with that as well as cancer. Um, but do you know what? I think, I mean, this is personally very great for me, but I have this book to write. <laughs> and so um, co- that coinciding with the fact that I had to stay inside my house <laughs> has worked to my advantage a little bit. So where are you at with it? Um, I'm 43,000 words in. Um, that's amazing. You know, well, you've written books, so you know, but you know, yeah, like, a, one, a lot of words. Yeah. Well, you know, like, after a, a good writing day, you're like, oh my God, I've just, do you know what? Yeah, you're the best. You feel like you're smashing it. Yeah. And then the next day comes around and you've written like 10 words and like everything shit, like everything yeah. I've written is crap. It's such a roller coaster. It's so unreal. Really it's, it's actually quite horrific. And, and sometimes, you know, you get to the end of the book and you go, great. And then you read it again and go, oh, why is I so chuffed? This is shit. And it's just, it's oscillating completely the whole time. But again, this is something that no one's told you to do this. You're writing a book. You are making it happen. You're doing it your way. And I guess lockdown has forced us to all be slightly more focused on the things we've been slightly putting off as well. So you know, I want to read that book. So I'm glad that you've got to just get this done. This needs to happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I was like very confident in what I was going to say in the intro. FYI, this was written during a global pandemic and actually the whole world felt like it was falling to shit. So mm. just, you know. Yeah. Um, because I think people need to be aware of that um, when they read it. Mm, no, I had the same. I've literally just handed a book in and it's hard to have clarity at the moment I think for anyone you know like you said when people have said oh I'm going to learn Spanish or learn to knit during lockdown and then you're like my brain actually can't take any more information in because we're so subconsciously overloaded with navigating this weirdness 
that you can't do new stuff right now. I mean, it would be crazy. And, you know, we've been making this festival, which has pushed me to my limits at times, but I do know it's worth it because I think people need something like this right now. But yeah, I think having the clarity to do a new project like writing a book is insane. But perhaps... Um, gets us connected to a very raw place that maybe then gives us more to go with. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm, I'm such a procrastinator and I think um, if there was ever like an opportunity to go out and like, go outside and hang out and do something more fun, then I would take it. Um, so it really has made me almost like stick to something and really focus on something. And yeah, I've had really, really awful days. Mm. We like trying to focus on what moments that I'm writing about that I haven't visited in a very long time. Mm. Um, so I've had to allow myself to have moments of like not writing because I didn't, and I didn't realize that you could, when you're planning a book, you don't realize oh, on that day, I'm going to feel partic particularly um, crap about what happened um so i can't write anymore um you just don't know what feelings are going to come up i think when and I, I just wasn't really expecting that and i hadn't planned for it at all um yeah but i'm kind of glad That's... because obviously it's making me write in the most authentic way i think hopefully oh without a doubt it's gonna be a bloody great book because of that because you are quite literally pouring it all out of you and i think it's a funny process because yes you'll have those days where you go that was really not nice to go back there. And you feel a little bit um, edgy for like a few days because you're sort of almost, you've occupied that headspace again. It's a re, because you're so in it when you're writing it. You sort of are reliving it cognitively. It's a really strange space to be in. But I think, I don't know how you'll feel later down the line, but I've certainly felt when I've talked about personal things that then actually after the book's released and we've all, you know, talked about it or whatever, I feel a lot better about that on a deeper level because I've sort of dealt with a bit of it um, or I've, looked, I've prodded it around a bit more. Um, sometimes it's kind of a good, a good sort of pain to go through, I guess, in a way. But, you know, that'll be your own bespoke process that you'll go through in your own way. And, yeah. and, it, and it'll be so worth it because that book is going to be so bloody brilliant. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, you know, I just thought I have I've had 11 years now. Surely I'm ready and I've processed everything and I've analysed everything and I conclude everything. But um, some stuff was really, still really raw and I just didn't realise. Yeah. And actually, I got sent this really amazing video by Glennon Doyle, who I know you love. <laughs> Right. And she writes about this and about how you find the words um, when you're writing something, when you write something creatively. And, um, and she's like, you need to look at whether you're writing with an open wound or if you're writing something that has now turned into gold. And I was like, so whenever I was writing something that was really like bringing up a lot of feelings, I was like, is this an open wound or is it actually gold? Wow, yet? that's a cool way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, no. And then by the end of the day, I was like, no, it's gold. It's fucking gold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And it I'm is. just going to, I'm just going to go with it because God, if I'm not ready now, then when the hell will I be? <laughs> mm. And it's, you know, not, you know, no one wants to go back and think about painful times and you've had a lot of them. No one wants to do that, but, um, you are quite literally mining gold for other people to read. So, you know, keep plowing on. Um, let's talk about Copperfield because, you know, it is an important time to discuss, you know, charities have been hit so hard this year across the board um just hugely and we're talking about we've been talking about a lot of issues and you know the pandemic being something that's been on all of our minds for a long time and like you say that has pushed other um illnesses you know to the bottom of the pile but there but there's still people getting diagnosed with cancer every day and we can't stop looking at how these charities are massively game changing for people. I mean, it's not just like a bit of help, a, you know, an arm reached out. This is huge, huge fundamental change and help for people's lives. So do you just want to talk, talk to us now and for people that don't know much about Copperfield, about why it's important and essentially what your mission is? Yes. Um, so essentially our job is to make people check their boobs, know the signs and symptoms of breast cancer and have the confidence and a sense of empowerment when they go and see a GP and tell them about their symptoms that they've noticed. Um, ultimately, we want to ensure that all breast cancers are diagnosed early um, and that means that they are then more survivable um, and because 
believe it or not, breast cancer is a survivable disease. It's a very curable disease, but it, you stand a way, way bigger chance at uh, surviving if it's diagnosed early. Um, and obviously that all stems from my own experience of being told that I was too young for breast cancer when I was 23 and going months and months without any treat, any um, tests and screening. And uh, eventually I was told it was stage four breast cancer. So it had already spread, giving me a very low chance of surviving beyond, well, they say five years, but I mean, here I am 11 years later. Um, so and I'm, the thing is not everyone's as lucky as me. Well, not many people as lucky as me. I'm, I'm, I'm an anomaly. <laughs> Um, and it shouldn't really be that way. So our job is to keep reminding people to check their boobs because it's not one of those one-off things that you do and feel good about yourself. Um, so we like to stay in people's lives. We're a bit creepy like that. So we obviously encourage you to sign up to our text reminder service, which is a free service. And every month we remind you to check your boobs and it's usually quite an amusing message. Um, our social media is a good way to remind people to check their boobs, um, as well as it being quite educational and fun. Um, and I think what's quite good about us at this time is that we have, we are quite digitally savvy already because obviously we are aimed at a younger age group. So we have to be so adapting to this virus and making things go online hasn't been as big a challenge for us as some, but it doesn't replace that old fashioned, but still super powerful face to face interaction that we started with in a field yeah. at a festival 11 years yeah. ago when we just started talking to people about boobs. Um, and so that is what we would be doing at this time. We would be going to festivals in our boob band, Belinda. Belinda. Putting... Honestly, Belinda caused such a fuss at the Happy Place Festival last year. There was a queue from Belinda onto the site the whole weekend. I, mean, I don't know what you were even doing in there, but people were just like going back and back. That's the power of glitter and temporary tattoos. The power. There you go. And then chatting about boobs while she's doing it. Yeah, I like it. Exactly. Um, so that's what we should be doing. And, mm. and um, obviously we're trying to do things online a bit more. Um, a lot of our, I mean, a lot of our events have been canceled. My biggest baby and my love of my life, Festival has been canceled this year as well, which is our, you know, it's what you create with me, um, our music oh, festival. It's, beautiful. In it's London. been an amazing, amazing, um, just like a big party every year for all of us, which has been such a joy and a really clever way of getting people to engage in this conversation because they come to like dance and, you know, listen to great music and see brilliant bands. Like you had Stereophonics and all sorts of great people there. Um, but actually then they're hearing the messaging all day long to check your boobs, uh, which is genius. And it is just, I'm gutted that we're not doing it, but you know, next year we'll make it twice as big and better oh, yeah. definitely i mean we are going to be doing some stuff because obviously we tried to make as much noise as possible during october because it's breast cancer awareness month and our lovely friends at house of vans is where we obviously put on the event they're trying to adapt to this whole new world because obviously they're yeah. in the best place and they need to be doing something so we're working on something that is nowhere near as brilliant and amazing as a live event but it's going to be still a celebration of what cop feel is a little you know a little something intriguing intriguing you've, you've always got stuff going on oh, you've always got always. things going on always um well i just love you quite frankly and i'm so glad that we got to have this chat i mean i i sort of i feel like really ignorant that i didn't sort of see how bad it has been in like those stats that you gave me at the top i'm still sort of in shock and really sad about that and um oh just you know keep doing what you're doing because it's so amazing and i think you know i've obviously spoken to tons of people that have been to copperfield events or uh follow you on instagram or engage with what copperfield and you personally are doing and it's just you know such a comfort and solace to so many people so um you know, keep doing it and and thank you. I'm so glad that you could be part of the festival again this sure, year. I'm when all this silly shit's over and we're going for lunch or for tea or we're having a walk or because so, I can't. That's what's happening. That's Absolutely. what's happening. And thanks so much for supporting Copperfield through Happy Place and like obviously 
you're you're a treasured patron of the charity um, and thanks for supporting us during this horrible time <laughs> i'm a proud patron i'll do anything for you guys so we'll keep the message rolling we've got other copperfield stuff happening at the festival that you guys can check out as well one of our uh charity partners on board so uh do roam around the website see what else you can find and chris thank you so much for today thank you